All right, class, we're on to, to close out the morning strong. Um, starting with a topic again, and I think it's incredibly important for us, which is the, the appropriate uh, use and how to understand uh, the criteria for cardiac imaging. Um, I think it's just so uh, basic a part of understanding as we become more and more cardiologists, we need help. And uh, some of the help is in the imaging. So from the Cleveland Clinic, we're very happy to have Dr. David Walensky. And uh, his, uh, his talk is sponsored by an educational grant from uh, Astellas. David, take it away. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Um, and I really think this talk follows uh, with a lot of the other talks about risk factor uh, assessment, risk factor management, when you need to go a little bit further, and as we talk about appropriate use criteria and really rationing of healthcare a little bit. So these are my disclosures. Uh, these are the learning objectives. Uh, basically what we're going to do is, we've got all these risk factors that we've discussed. How do you put them together to sort of determine a baseline risk? Um, add symptoms if you have it. Figure out what tests are available. Uh, which really start with some sort of provocative exercise test. But for many people in this population, now they can't exercise, so what are the alternatives? And then understand the appropriate use criteria. And just a quick question. How many people in this room are aware of the PAMA Act and what's going to be required of you starting January 1st whenever you order uh, an advanced imaging test? Okay, so, you know, this remains a problem, and, and, and all of you are uh, due for a, uh, a rather rude awakening. You know, I could stand up here with hubris and just say it's all about the heart. Um, but when you look at this, it really is all about the heart. Cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of death. We did a little bit better from uh, 2000 to 2010, then uh, the diabetes started to kick in, the overweight, and uh, things like that. Uh, we slipped a little bit in 2016. We fell to second, but uh, uh, now we're back being number one again. Um, and it's not going to go away. 14% uh, of all healthcare dollars, and we need to find a way to reduce this. Uh, somebody mentioned that earlier. It really is all about prevention. It's not once the, the horse is out of the barn. Um, a discussion of women in coronary disease really is um, a window into our understanding of healthcare disparity and uh, what we don't know. Um, cardiovascular death is highest among women, particularly in black women. Women often have atypical symptoms, which leads them uh, not to be recognized. And even when they have acute coronary syndrome, which means they have objective EKG changes and enzymes, they're less likely to undergo revascularization. And even when they do, the mortality rate is higher. Despite that, they have less epicardial uh, disease. So we're often talking about false positive stress tests when it's really a false negative coronary angiography. They're more likely to die of heart failure uh, and stroke. Two-thirds of the women don't recognize these symptoms, and survival after a myocardial infarction is much worse in women than it is in men. I'm not going to go over this slide in detail because it's been discussed before, but just approximately two-fold relative cardiovascular risk in the diabetic population. But I do want to look a little bit more at this end-stage renal disease, many of whom are diabetic. Uh, we do an awful lot of pre-kidney transplant uh, evaluations, and it's really amazing the level or sometimes lack of level of, of control of risk factors in this population. But half of cardiovascular deaths is due to end-stage renal disease. Um, Two-thirds of patients who are age 65 or older have cardiovascular disease. When you see somebody with heart failure, it's really hard to know whether it's cardiac or it's just simply fluid overload, so you may not evaluate them properly. Transplant helps, but still doesn't uh, uh, improve the risk dramatically, and these patients consume large amounts of cardiovascular resources. So it's certainly important to get to them and prevent them getting to the end-stage renal disease category. Simple slide here just showing that with every cardiovascular presentation, it's worse with, with chronic kidney disease. So this is really what the rest of the talk is going to be about. Why test? And there's two simple reasons. You want to prevent sudden death, 
and you want to prevent a heart attack. Because the rest of the things we can really treat with medicine. So, so what does cardiac testing accomplish? Um, if we find a high-risk patient, we have to be able to do something about it. We'll know a lot more in a month from now when the ischemia study comes out. Um, a near normal or normal test result identifies somebody who doesn't need a lot more expensive treatment and shouldn't get a lot more expensive testing. Increasing degree of abnormality associated with increased risk. So when you get to the highest risk population of whatever threshold you decide, you know that offering them advanced treatment is, is reasonable. And you, have a, you will not have a lot of people uh, for whom advanced treatment is not going to be helpful. Um, we've got to have outcomes data, real world outcomes data. Uh, we all know how good everything is in clinical studies, but we need real world data. It's got to be cost effective. And then you've got to get to the point of really being able to say there's a difference because we can image and whether we should image. So let's talk about risk a little bit, okay? Um, I'm going to show you three pictures of, of somebody preparing to jump off a bridge. And you want to know what the risk is, because that's really a cardiac assessment when they come to your office. You don't need to do any tests. It's real easy to jump off the bridge. And if you know where this is, this is uh, uh, St. Andrews in Scotland, and I couldn't wait to jump off and uh, go run around the golf course. If I'm here with a high-risk patient, if you come in with a, a large ascending, nearly rupturing thoracic aortic aneurysm, your risk is high if we don't do anything. You don't need any testing. So testing is important when you're at an intermediate risk, and there are questions to answer, all right? Um, is there water in the pool? Can I swim? Um, are there alligators in the pool? All sorts of things like that. That's where a clinical risk assessment comes into play. So we've talked about, and we'll talk about, high blood pressure and diabetes and hyperlipidemia. And you basically start out with three categories. What's their preclinical risk? Low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. You can use Framingham, you can use the Reynolds score for women. Uh, I think most of us now use the global risk assessment. I keep it on my phone and do the calculation in my office in front of the patient. Then you add symptoms, and this is what we usually rely on, what's called Diamond and Forrester. And it's really simple. Uh, most of these things are just threes. Three risk categories, here three types of uh, categories, age, gender, and type of symptoms. Three types of symptoms. Definite angina, retrosternal chest pain relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. Atypical has two of them. And non-anginal chest pain, which has one or zero. So based on that, you can then add that risk calculation to figure out what somebody's pretest likelihood it is to determine what you really want to do for them. Once you decide to do a test, you need to decide whether this test is appropriate. And this test appropriate has been thrown around quite a bit. But in simple terms, these appropriate use criteria were meant to help the clinician decide what to do. That is, for a given patient in a given clinical scenario, when will this test most likely give you more information than cause more harm? What has caused more harm? Uh, lead to another test in a procedure that's complicated, lead to another test that they have a bad reaction, not get treated because the test was done poorly and we missed the diagnosis of the disease. And things are categorized as appropriate, maybe appropriate, and rarely appropriate. And so we've had a variety of different multimodality criteria come out. It exists for every cardiac procedure and every cardiac diagnostic test. It started with radionuclide imaging actually in 2005. I didn't put that up. But then in 2009 was, was the update of it. And what most of us in cardiology now live by is what's called the 2013 multimodality appropriate use criterion um, for detection and risk of stable ischemic heart disease. Uh, you can get this on an app very, very easily. And it's not meant to really determine whether one test is better than another one, but it's determine which tests or tests are reasonable to do in a clinical scenario. So these are what we're going to be talking about a little bit today, exercise treadmill test, echocardiography with stress, stress nuclear stress testing or myocardial effusion scan, calcium score, a little bit about coronary CTA, and stress MRI. So let's start with the basics, an exercise treadmill test. When you want to stress somebody or assess somebody for 
coronary artery disease or coronary insufficiency, you should always try and exercise them because there's a tremendous amount of information that, that can be gained. Readily available, inexpensive, easy to do. You can reproduce their symptoms. You can assess their functional capacity, look at their heart rate, their blood pressure response, and their heart rate recovery. Obviously, look at ST segment changes, look for arrhythmias, and then you can combine this with imaging such as echo, SPECT, or PET. We have very, very few 1A indications in cardiology. Most of them are 1B or 2A. Exercise stress testing in the low to intermediate risk patient is a 1A indication. So you can't go wrong with doing that test as your starting test if your patient can exercise. Uh, this is some data from Jamie Bork from the University of Virginia, and it just talks about the patient who can go 10 mets without chest pain and without ischemic EKG changes. The likelihood of him being ischemic on the left is very, very low, and the mortality of these people, as you see on the right, is very, very low. So unless they're unstable, patients say, does that mean I, I don't have any heart problems? And the answer is not, do you have any heart problems? There are other ways to look for coronary disease. It means their risk is low. And it doesn't mean you don't need to treat them to prevent disease, but it tells them that their disease at this point in time is not risky. This was the woman's study. We always thought that stress tests were inaccurate in women uh, for, because uh, estrogen mimicked digitalis, and we know that digitalis uh, uh, causes false positive stress tests, and also women may have poor exercise capacity. But in women who are low to intermediate risk who can exercise, there's no difference in risk stratification between uh, exercise myocardial perfusion scan and exercise stressing. That a normal test has a very, very low risk, and an abnormal test may have an increased risk. On the right, it looks different, but it's not statistically significant. There are some problems with exercise stress tests uh, because of the diagnostic accuracy if it's abnormal. If you take a person who's got a positive stress test and take them to an imaging study or an angiogram, only 39% of these people will have abnormalities. I also call your attention to what's over on the left. Uh, often we'll exercise somebody in good shape and we'll see rather dramatic exercise, ST depression, right at peak exercise. And as soon as they lie down, within a minute, they're all gone. Their prognosis is even better than people who have a normal stress test. So that rapidly resolving ST segment depression uh, is associated with a very low risk. We can make stress testing better by incorporating the Duke treadmill score. And when you order a test from a cardiologist, uh, you should ask for the Duke treadmill score. But if you don't have it, Again, there's an app for that. And again, it's really just three things. Uh, how many minutes do they do? How much ST segment changes there are? And the angina index, which has to do with uh, whether the, they had no pain, they stopped because of pain, or they stopped because of another reason. And again, high, low, intermediate risk. Low risk, you're golden. High risk, you're golden. Intermediate risk is the population that may become difficult to deal with. I use calcium score, and I often use calcium score in combination with, risk, with, with stress testing in people who are symptomatic and low risk. Um, calcium score is really, to me, a teachable moment to, uh, to explain to patients the difference between atherosclerotic plaque, atherosclerotic burden, reducing atherosclerosis, and defining ischemia and obstructive coronary artery disease. Uh, good in most populations. Uh, older people, renal people, uh, may have uh, a lot of plaque of unclear clinical significance, particularly the renal, renal patients because they have Monksburg medial sclerosis and you can't tell. May miss plaque in the young woman particularly because they still have soft plaque. But in general, increased coronary calcium score, increased risk, and according to the guidelines now that came out last year, as you can see on the bottom, you can actually reclassify risk up or down with a calcium score and guide whether patients are candidates for statin therapy. It's a window into ischemia. So on the uh, x-axis is Framingham risk. On the y-axis is the likelihood of having ischemia. If you add calcium score to the Framingham risk, you have better risk stratification, and you can see uh, that the higher the coronary calcium score, 
uh, the higher the risk, and in an intermediate population, 15 to 84 percent, a negative calcium score really reduces their risk dramatically. This is a complicated algorithm. I'm not going to go over it in detail. I'm going to blow it up, though, basically, and say to you, you know, if they can exercise, they should exercise uh, uh, with a treadmill. If their EKG is interpretable, if their EKG is uninterpretable, you have to add imaging. Um, or if they can't exercise, then they're candidates for pharmacologic stress testing. Uh, primarily with myocardial perfusion imaging, I think it's done much more often than dobutamine stress test, and it's done much more often than um, uh, MR stress testing. Myocardial perfusion imaging has been around for 40 years. It's well established. It's reproducible. It can be done in all populations. No contraindications, whether they can exercise or not, whether their heart rate is fast or slow, whether it's regular or irregular whether they have chronic kidney or not. It's sensitive, it's specific, and we have a tremendous body of historical data that helps us with risk stratification, okay? Normal scans have low risk in all populations. Now, in certain populations, they're not as low as everything. If you take the average person, the normal myocardial perfusion scan has a risk of about 0.35 to 0.5% per year, all right? If you have coronary artery disease, the risk is a little higher, but still stratifies uh, normal versus abnormal. And again, the patients who can't exercise have a slightly increased risk. I know this is a hard slide to see, but I think it's an important slide because as we begin to talk about appropriate use criterion and we talk about abnormal tests, it's really important to know. So if you look at the purple slides, you can see there's a, a, a dramatic difference between, um, these are appropriately ordered tests and you can see the risk stratification is dramatically different between uh, normal and an abnormal. On the other hand, if you take a test that was ordered inappropriately for inappropriate indications, then there's very little risk stratification and it really doesn't help you. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at death MI or whether you're looking at cardiac death or MI. So these appropriate use criterion help you to get more information out of your provocative test. Uh, although we look at images, we can quantitate this. And I think that's really important. So there are 17 segments in our model. Each segment can have a maximum score of uh, four if there's no uptake. So 17 times four is 68. We can just put that score in and calculate what's called the total perfusion defect. For instance, if the sum stress score is 12, the total perfusion defect is 17. And that's important as we talk about risk stratification. This is important. Uh, I'm not going to go over it in great detail, but you do have it as a reference. But these are the criterion that define high risk. People with bad LV function, people with bad stress tests, people with ejection fraction falls, people have large amount of stress-induced ischemia, people have a significant amount of underlying plaque. So just as calcium score adds to Framingham risk, Stress myocardial perfusion scan augments risk stratification in the calcium score. And I want you to focus on the power of zero that you can see. If somebody's got a calcium score of zero, in the absence of classic symptoms, their risk is very, very low, and over the short term, you don't need to do anything. Coram Nasir, who's now at Houston, talks about this at all. And if you ever had a chance to look at his lecture on the power of zero, I ask you to look at it. On the other hand, look at... Um, on the left, on the right, then you can see that when the coronary calcium score is uh, over 1,000, the likelihood of having an event increases. And if you push this out here to 2,000 and even 3,000, the risk gets even higher. So if you have a coronary calcium score of 2,000 or more, your two-year risk is the same as somebody who has a markedly positive stress echo, stress myocardial perfusion scan, or significant coronary artery disease by coronary angiography. This is a classic slide that we all talk about. It's 15 years old now. It was reported by Rory Hakamovich at Cedar sinai And it looked at that 
perfusion defect that I talked about. And so this is the cutoff between 10 and 12%. Observationally, if you have perfusion defect less than 10, 12, 10 to 12%, you do better with medical therapy. On the other hand, if you have greater than 12.5%, you do better with revascularization. And this is what much of the guidelines have been based on. Now again, the ischemia study will be coming out, the American Heart meetings next week. That may change what we think about it, but this is the standard of how we practice cardiology and how the guidelines for intervention, the appropriate use criterion for intervention also work. So what is a high risk scan? And we'll go over it in a little detail here. We have th three views, short axis, vertical axis, and long and horizontal views. We have stress images and rest images and we compare the relative perfusion, relative uptake, from one segment to another. So here's an abnormal scan that shows a large defect at the apex, uh, a large defect at the septum, a defect at the anterior wall and the inferior wall. So it's consistent with multivessel coronary disease. The other thing to look at is the donut hole, okay? That's the uh, cavity size. And because you have so much subendocardial ischemia, there's a decrease in perfusion in that area, a decreased tracer uptake. So what you see is a bigger cavity, and those are high-risk markers that are associated with increased coronary risk. But not everybody can exercise, and one of the advantages of the myocardial perfusion scan is that we can do pharmacologic stress testing in these people. Um, it won't give us symptoms, it won't give us EKG changes, it won't give us functional capacity, but it has the same ability to stratify high risk and low risk. Regadenosin, which is one of the pharmacologic stress agents that is probably being used 85% of the time, has the ability to change on the fly. So you try exercising somebody, they do less than five minutes of exercise or they can't get uh, their heart rate to 85% maximal predicted. Uh, you can uh, slow down the treadmill and I'll show you that in the next slide. Side effects are relatively mild with pharmacologic stress. Um, now there's about 50%, we're up to 60% in our lab, patients who are referred for pharmacologic stress for all sorts of uh, indications. The inability to exercise is associated with increased risk. Therefore, your decision to send somebody for a pharmacologic stress whether it's a dobutamine echo or an adenosine or regadenosine farm stress, automatically puts them at increased risk. Your stress test will still risk stratify them, but their risk is higher even uh, just by their inability to exercise. And that's been shown by multiple, multiple studies with or without imaging. In terms of risk prediction, exercise stress and pharmacologic stress have the same risk stratification ability. So let's look at the agents that we have available, dipyridamol, adenosine, regadenosine, and dobutamine. Dipyridamol is given by slow IV push. Adenosine, you need to use a pump for. Regadenosine has a short infusion, really closer to 10 seconds now. Dobutamine is a prolonged infusion with prolonged side effects. I didn't have room to list regadenosine on there, but it's, uh, to list gadolinium on there, but it's part of a long complex um, MRI protocol. The stress with dipyridamol is 10 to 12 minutes. It's much lower with regadenosine and much greater with dobutamine. Dipyridamol, regadenosine, and adenosine all have aminophilin as an antidote. Metoprolol can be used as an antidote to dobutamine. Um, when they compare to adenosine to regadenosine, uh, Almost twice as many people preferred the regadenosine stress test. So when you add that to the ability to convert on the fly, that's why we really have chosen to use regadenosine most of the time. This is a paper that uh, Vascon Dilsisian from Maryland reported, looking at uh, complications of stress testing, looking this time at exercise dobutamine, uh, the three vasodilator agents and gadolinium, and you can see the risk factor profile with regadenosine is really very, very small, okay? Nephrogenic sclerosis uh, is an issue with uh, gadolinium and also renal insufficiency is a contraindication. With dobutamine, there's a higher incidence of arrhythmias. 
uh, and dipyridinol, it's a longer protocol with some wheezing, so it's contraindicated in patients with lung disease. This is what I talked about earlier, the ability to convert on the fly. And so the next step up from stress echo or stress myocardial perfusion imaging um, is cardiac PET. About 10% of studies are done with PET in this country. PET, this, and this is from the American Society of Nuclear Guidelines uh, that I was one of the authors of. It is a first-line preferred test, which means if you have it for somebody who can't exercise, they're a candidate for it. They have to have suspected coronary disease. They have to meet the appropriate use criterion for stress imaging. And there are really no areas where PET should not be considered a preferred test for patients who are candidates for pharmacologic stress. It's also suggested as the test of choice in patients uh, who are appropriate who have had poor quality stress imaging in the past, for young people who you don't want to give a lot of radiation to, for obese people where you don't get good spec images, for high-risk patients where you don't want to make a mistake, and for whom myocardial blood flow will help you make the diagnosis. So here's an example of a normal PET scan. You can see how nice these images look. They certainly look really nice on my monitor, although they're a little fuzzy over here. We get the simple quantitation of total perfusion defect. Uh, and we can measure reversible ischemia. In addition, we can measure ejection fractions. Because we do these tests so quickly, we actually can measure a stress ejection fraction and a rest ejection fraction. The ejection fraction that we get with SPECT is done half an hour after the injection, so it's really a post-stress uh, uh, ejection fraction. But the ejection fraction should go up by four points, the ejection falls, that's a high-risk finding, and you see fall and ejection fraction from 75 to 60 associated with a significant amount of ischemia. The other thing that makes it important is we understand physiology with this. We can measure coronary blood flow. Whereas I told you, SPEC looks at relative uptake, PET looks at absolute uptakes. And we know that the anatomy visualization doesn't really tell you how bad a stenosis is, okay? This has a coronary flow reserve of 1.0, which is abnormal. This has a flow reserve of 3.4, which is abnormal. They both show stenosis. Here's a coronary flow reserve of 1.0. When you look at it, it doesn't look that bad, but you've had remod positive remodeling, so the whole artery gets a little bit bigger, and you can see there's a reduction here. And so what PET does is actually takes patients from just the regular low, intermediate, and high risk by perfusion. When you add flow to it, you can actually, 15% of the patients go from low risk and move up, 11% of the high risk patients move down, and half the patients who are the intermediate risk actually gets reclassified. So the ability to fl use flow, to me, is probably the number one indication to use cardiac PET. Well, what about coronary CTA? Uh, a lot of people do CTA. You hear a lot of ads now for coronary flow reserve. Uh, the data on the left is what MPI can be done, as I told you before. Coronary CTA really does have a negative pr uh, predictive value that's high. If you don't see any plaque, and you don't see any obstruction, you don't have any disease. Um, the problem is you only get one shot at it, whereas myocardial perfusion imaging, if you don't have a good scan, you can re-image them. You're limited by diallergy, irregular heart rate, and uh, high calcium burden. In an intermediate patient, the uh, stress radionuclide imaging is appropriate in all categories. So the PROMISE study looked at myocardial perfusion imaging versus, well, actually it looked at functional imaging versus uh, anatomic imaging with CTA with the hope that it would show that it would be uh, better than functional imaging or at least uh, non-inferior. So what you could see here, patients who are relatively low to intermediate risk, there's no difference between CTA uh, and functional testing. But if you look a little further, and the difference between functional testing and CTA, okay, you have 50% more invasive cath, you have twice as many revascularizations and twice as many cabbage. So you're doing a lot more procedures with the same result. 
You've heard a lot, obviously, about diabetics. This is just a, a graph of the diabetic e uh, epidemic in America. And I do want to talk a lot about, a little bit about the role of testing in this population. So 20 years ago, Steve Hafner defined what's called the atherosclerotic risk. That said, if you're a diabetic uh, and had no coronary disease, your risk of having a cardiac event is the same as a non-diabetic who has uh, a prior coronary event. So we started calling all these people atherosclerotic equivalents. We started doing stress tests on all things. The dyad study showed, however, that screening asymptomatic diabetics does not change outcome. So we need to understand a little bit more about how we evaluate the diabetics. So I'll show you a case here. 57-year-old woman presents to her oncologist for evaluation of breast cancer. Contemplation of surgery is adriamycin, paclitaxel, and cyclophosphamine. Her baseline echo showed an ejection fraction of 42% with some wall motion abnormalities. She had never seen a cardiologist before. So the standard at that institution was to have anybody who's about to get adriamycin with any kind of abnormality get referred for evaluation and clearance for chemotherapy. Taking history and going a little bit further, she's got a 24-year-old, 24-year history of diabetes and hypertension. She has no chest pain, but she's dyspneic after a quarter of a mile, and that's recent onset. EKG is normal and LDL is not available. So here are the appropriate use criterion, intermediate pretest probability. You can see that a variety of tests are appropriate here. But certainly stress radionuclide imaging was a reasonable thing to do. She couldn't walk that well, uh, so we did farm stress on her. She had a large perfusion defect in the left anterior descending artery territory that reversed. She had a smaller reversible defect in the right coronary territory and she underwent coronary angiography that showed a critical lesion uh, in both the right coronary, the LAD, and the circumflex, so she underwent coronary bypass. If you want to look in the diabetic between coronary bypass versus PCI, patients with three-vessel disease, the Berry 2D study suggests that multi-vessel, three-vessel PCI is inferior to coronary bypass in this population. This is the REACH registry that was published a few years ago that just looked at atherosclerotic patients with or without risk, with or without diabetes. And so clearly the diabetic with known atherosclerosis is at the highest risk. But the diabetic in general is at the second increased risk. So if you, not all diabetics are at risk, but if you've got suspicion with an abnormal EKG, with new symptoms, with things that just don't seem right when you talk to them. You have to be suspicious about these people. So not everybody is truly an atherosclerotic equivalent, but the primary care physician really knows this patient best of all who can make these decisions. But they don't need to be thought of as ticking time bombs. In general with women, you want to start with an exercise treadmill strategy, as I talked about, unless they're intermediate to high risk, unless they have EKG changes, or unless they can't exercise. So let me show you a second case. 50-year-old female presents with five episodes of retrosternal chest pain while jogging. She has mild asthma. She uses a hormone replacement therapy and albuterol. She had a prior calcium score that was 48 that put her at a relatively low risk. Vital signs, labs are not that bad. I think with a calcium score now of 48, we'd probably put her on statin, but this was about nine years ago. She had a treadmill test, five minutes of exercise, Typical chest pain with ST segment depression. Positive test, high risk test, don't need to go any further. Underwent coronary angiography and had PCI of her left anterior descending artery. 26 months uh, later, two months after she stopped her dual antiplatelet therapy, she had three episodes of retrosternal discomfort while walking. She wasn't sure what this was, whether it was her typical symptoms, because she had a little wheezing and an upper respiratory tract infection, but she said it might be her angina. So again, looking at the appropriate use criterion, stress and radionuclide imaging is appropriate in the symptomatic ischemic patient. So she underwent a myocardial perfusion scan, she exercised farther, and her images are normal. So don't use the appropriate use criterion to look for a test. 
Think about the patient. What information do they need to know? What information do you need to get? Think about what tests may help you, and then use that as a backup if necessary. 36-year-old male with hypertension and hyperlipidemia, strong family history. Oh, let me tell you a little follow-up on that last patient based on what we talked about. Um, so five years later, she presented with some chest pain. Um, again, she was a candidate for reevaluation. Uh, the radiology benefits manager uh, wouldn't approve it. I tried to get through the insurance company. Uh, there's no way to get through a medical director at the insurance company. So I found somebody who was the head of marketing, and I wrote a letter to the head of marketing and said, I am head of health policy for both the Florida chapter of ACC and the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. You just refused to do a test on me, and you denied them of appropriate care that they needed. If you don't want a letter to the editor in every newspaper in the state of Florida, you better have somebody call me by the end of the day. I actually got a phone call back. Um, and we got the test done, it was negative, and now I will take it up with them a little bit further. So uh, we're working, we're here to help you if you have any questions. 36 year old male, multiple risk factors, symptoms on and off, sometimes when they exercise, lasted 10 minutes, no symptoms for a week, history of anaphylaxis from dye, small and thin, EKG shows some T wave changes, uh, and maybe LVH. He really didn't want to pursue an invasive procedure right away. So he underwent exercise stress testing. He had left shoulder tightness with two millimeter ST segment depression at 14 mets. Now if you use the Duke treadmill score, this comes out to an intermediate risk. But if you look at his perfusion scan, you can see there's almost the entire left anterior descending artery territory is not perfused. And again, you can see the same thing there with 68% of his myocardium involved. So um, he underwent coronary angiography, and I don't, there it goes. And you can see the tight, tight lesion in his left anterior descending artery, and he underwent stenting. So we did a stress-first procedure. We didn't need a resting scan. We reduced radiation and time, and he actually got the whole thing done in approximately 18 hours. And many patients are candidates for stress-only imaging to reduce radiation time to improve patient uh, uh, experience. 70% uh, of intermediate risk patients who undergo spec imaging are normal, which means they don't need a resting scan. If the stress is normal, the resting scan is not necessary. It's only necessary to distinguish between ischemia and infarction or to confirm that you have artifact. This is the European guideline, and it's important to know and look back on, but this just came out. But it didn't rely so much on pretest probability, but it really did look at when to do non-invasive testing, when to do coronary angiography, and when to do revascularization. And I'll leave it for you to review um, in, uh, at a later date because you have it there. And I think the American guidelines in the next couple of years will probably come out with something that's relatively simple. So what can we do to help? How can we make stress testing available to patients that need it and reduce what's not needed for patients. Well, here's choosing wisely. I think you're all probably familiar with that. Five tests the patients should undergo, low risk testing, okay? Somebody who asymptomatic basically, low risk pre-op, low risk asymptomatic, they don't need anything done. I've developed something called Refer Wisely. You can look up Refer Wisely. Uh, dot com, or you can go to the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, but it really is a tool to help patients, uh, help clinicians understand the role of testing, when it would help, when it would won't help. And there's a variety of tests on there, there's cases, there's podcasts, you can find it all on YouTube if you look up referwisely.com. There's a poster in there that really talks about management of these people. Uh, some of us who are involved in this know how to tweet all this stuff out to give you information. I will admit, don't ask me about that. But you do need to know about the appropriate use criterion because of the PAM Act in 2014. That said, starting in 2016, any advanced test, CT, MR, PET, any organ of the body, every organ of the, the body, you're gonna have to use an appropriate use criterion with a clinical decision support tool 
or you're going to be listed as an outlier and the doctor's not going to get paid. This is an older slide. I submitted this before the last draft rule came in. We've been able to delay it, but starting in um, January of this year, you are going to have to use or expected to use this decision support tool. Whatever your institution has put in. Now we're talking about for the last 45 minutes, the appropriate use criterion based on the ACC and the AHA. But there's a variety of different documents out there. So many of the institutions are gonna use something called Care Select, which is based on the American College of Radiology. And it's gonna be hard to compare apples to oranges because these are different appropriate use criteria. So David Winchester and I did a study on that. The concordance was poor. Ischemia was rare among patients who were deemed inappropriate by our criterion, but it was much more common in inappropriate patients deemed by the ACR. So uh, if you are listed as inappropriate by the ACR and you're denied because it's said to be inappropriate, you may miss something. Also, 20% of patients couldn't even be categorized. So it's gonna be very, very tough when we do that. How many people are already using the appropriate use criterion and a computerized decision support tool. Okay, so what's the take home message? The role of non-invasive testing has evolved over time. The goal of testing is not merely to confirm the diagnosis of coronary disease, but to risk stratify. Risk stratification is only appropriate if therapies are applied based on test results. We have AUC to confirm clinical decisions, not to determine necessity or deny testing. SPECT MPI is a highly effective tool for intermediate to high risk patients. Normal SPECT has a very, very low one year risk, whereas patients with greater than 10% burden have indications to proceed with revascularization. The CMS DAN data is gonna require you to use the decision support tool. So we're working hard, look at choosing wisely, look at refer wisely, uh, we're working with the American College of Physicians, by the way, on Refer Wisely. So that's a joint effort with them. Um, I think we have some question, time for questions later. Okay, good. And I thank you.